So for today's Dhamma talk, as usual, I don't plan what I'm going to speak about, but a few minutes before I came in here, someone asked me a really good question, and it's a question I hear quite often. There was somebody in their family, they find it very difficult to get on with, and they're very close. You know, family members, and they find it very difficult. The other person is always really being cruel and harsh to them. So, what can we do when it's someone in your family you can't get away from? But they're just hell to live with. So, what can you do? <laughs> so, that's happened so often in this world. I don't know why. You can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. And so, sometimes you'll start with them. The first story which comes up, a really nice one. I just, I didn't have time to mention this earlier, just before I came in here. Was that there was this Vietnamese girl who married an Australian, Caucasian. And they loved each other, really two good people. But the problem was her mother-in-law. I don't know why mothers-in-law have these reputations. But someone did tell me that if you rearrange the letters which, which spell mother-in-law, you rearrange those letters, it actually spells Hitler woman. <laughs> you, can you can try that when you go home. But not all women are like that, obviously, not more mothers-in-law. Some mothers are not really sweet and nice. But anyway, this was one of those mothers-in-law which, you know, she must have been sort of quite racist, I would suppose, because why did you marry some sort of an Asian girl? Aren't there nice Aussie girls to marry? Or whatever. I mean, you know, just, she, they fell in love. They're both really good people. But the Vietnamese girl, you know, she really, of course, and this is my husband's father, her mother, of course I've got to love her and got to try and reconcile so she realized I've got really good qualities and so she tried everything apparently, everything to try and find out how to get her mother-in-law to love her. She tried you know, getting special food for her, but you know, her mother-in-law didn't like noodles. <laughs> and, and tried, even then she went to the temple and asked the monk to do some chanting. Please make my mother-in-law love me. <laughs> Didn't work. She tried doing loving kindness meditation. You know, that's another type of meditation. You sit there, oh, may my love mother-in-law be happy and well. Maybe she free of suffering. May she be just so blissful. That didn't work. And she had tried everything, apparently, to get her mother-in-law to love her. Nothing worked, except the very last strategy which she used. Now you may know in the Vietnamese tradition, it's mostly Mahayana, they have this image of like Quan Yin, the goddess of mercy. Now you know sometimes as a Theravada Buddhist, we don't have that in Theravada Buddhism. You know, I've talked to many, many people over the years, and many, many people, especially like Vietnamese boat people, in those days when they sort of fled Vietnam and they just trusted their life, you know, to these rickety old boats, sailing a huge distance to get to Australia. Such a long, long, long journey. And most of them didn't make it. Some did. I remember a lot of them, they, they told me that they were just, you know, they were robbed by pirates. They had no money, they didn't know what they were going to do, they're going to make anywhere. And many of them, I remember them, you know, these are people I've talked to personally, eventually ended up in Perth. They said that they had uh, just almost losing it, and they saw this image of their, this, they call it Goddess of Mercy, Kuan Yin coming over the, the waves to them, and they swore to me they actually saw it. And then right behind this goddess of mercy, Kuan Yin, they saw a, a British frigate, you know, when Hong Kong was under the Brits, sailing towards them to save them. 
Guan Yin came first, obviously leading the Brits to rescue <laughs> rescue these poor refugees. And of course then they got taken to Hong Kong and eventually settled over here in Australia. There's so many stories like that. And it's something which, you know, in religion, in spirituality, you know, what actually did they see? But anyway, that's another question. But you know, you can't deny that they said they definitely saw that. But anyway, this woman said, well, what can I do? She went to the temple, and of course, in these stories, her meditation wasn't that good. Instead, she fell asleep. And when she was you know, asleep in the temple, and what she actually saw was like a vision of this goddess of mercy come to help her. And she was really surprised. But there was a difference. It wasn't the normal goddess of mercy you see in Buddhist temples, Mahayana temples. The one which she saw you know, looked like the ordinary goddess of mercy, but it had a different face. The face was exactly the same as her mother-in-law. <laughs> And that was always necessary. Once she, she saw her mother-in-law look like the goddess of mercy, next time she saw her mother-in-law, her attitude totally changed. Somehow or other, just seeing something beautiful, good, lovable, and really inspiring in a person who you didn't like, or didn't like you, was all that was necessary to change her attitude and apparently since that time, that uh, the, the, the Goddess of Mercy, otherwise known as Mother-in-Law, <laughs> changed her attitude. And now they have this beautiful relationship. And that was actually told by one of the Vietnamese nuns who live in Perth many years ago. A very beautiful story. She told that here one evening a long time ago. But I love the implications of that story. It's what you see in somebody will change the nature of what you see. Even though that took a bit of imagination, but nevertheless it was true. And sometimes just how do you deal with people who can sometimes be quite violent to you? As for me, that very often the people who try to be violent to me, I've been going around dressed like this for the last uh, 38 years here in Perth. And I do remember many, many times, even this one time here in Perth, when I was in Bunbury, I used to spend the afternoon sort of just meditating on the beach in Bunbury, because there was no one there. And as I was meditating on the beach, in the evening I was teaching in the prisons in, in, uh, in Bunbury, but actually the beach was far more dangerous so I remember just very clearly, if the monks know this story, I was sitting there very peacefully and suddenly I had come right past my head. I just started washing my breath again. Something else came past me and I opened my eyes and these were stones from the beach being thrown at me. And I could hear, because I you know, turned around to have a look, there was about six or seven teenage kids. And they were shouting. For those of you who remember this time, this was a time when I think, uh, at the time he was called Rajneesh. And he didn't, people really didn't like him. And I was dressed in orange. They didn't know what a Buddhist monk was. And so they started shouting at me, Get off our beach, Rajneeshi! That's what they said. They shouted. And another stone came past. So what would you do? If you have fear, you run away. If you have anger, you call the police or shout or something. But I've been trained as a Buddhist for many years. So what did I do? I stood up, turned around, and walked towards them. And that, honestly, I, I tell you, sometimes I think I must be crazy doing stuff like that. But anyway, because I walked towards them, they all threw down their stones and they started to run away. And I, and I shouted out, stop please. 
One of them stopped and I just went up to tell them, look, I'm not a Vaishnishi, I'm a Buddhist monk. You know, we don't try and hurt or oppress anybody. You shouldn't try and hurt and oppress us. I said it with such kindness that he said sorry and all his friends came and then I, I had the opportunity to teach them something about Buddhism. They all came to me because they were quite inspired that I didn't run away. Now when they were trying to uh, uh, hit me with stones. Now Bunbury Beach, you know, I used to meditate down there a lot, but it eventually it became a bit too dangerous for me, but it wasn't as dangerous from those kids throwing stones. The biggest danger came, <laughs> you know what's coming next, don't you? <laughs> and this is absolutely true. You know, I was good meditators. I'd meditate for a couple of hours and go really deep inside, and I was meditating. In the afternoon, maybe about two o'clock or something, there was no one there. So I just was meditating really nice and peacefully, and a couple of hours went past. And, and when I came out of my meditation, that's when there was you know, a few people were on that beach, you know, young people. And there was somebody sitting right next to me, on my left, and I looked around. And it was a 17-year-old uh, blonde in a bikini. Sitting right next to me. And I, <laughs> I turned around, you can't make these stories up. They actually happened. And I turned around on my right and it was this uh, redhead or something, also in a bikini, 17-year-old sitting next to me on the other side. And these two really beautiful young ladies sitting next to a monk on Bunbury Beach in the afternoon. <laughs> And I often say, if somebody had taken a photograph, how could you explain that? <laughs> and the point was, I knew they were 17, it could have been 18, but 17 probably, because the reason they were there, they explained afterwards. It was uh, in October, maybe November, I don't know, but it was that morning, or that afternoon, was the last examination for the end of school exams. And the school was just on the other opposite side of the road to the beach. And what do people in Australia do? They finish the last exam of their school year. They get into their bathers and go and have a bathe in the ocean. And they saw this, they explained this to me, they saw this, this Buddhist monk on there, sitting perfectly still. And they thought, wow! This is interesting, I wonder who the heck he is. And I was just sitting there patiently, just waiting for me to come out of my meditation. And when I did, they said, oh, you've been waiting for you now maybe 10 or 15 minutes for you to come out. What were you doing and why were you doing this? Who are you? They were really interested. But I must admit, I managed to end the conversation very quickly. <laughs> In case somebody saw me. But anyway. Because, you know, if a monk was celibate, and it's really important with celibate, and it makes it seem to be celibate, and imagine that, just two beautiful ladies on either side of you. Anyway, but... <laughs> thank you for laughing. But anyway, just, you get in a situations, and use your kindness to overcome those situations. One of my favorite monks years ago, he's obviously passed away now, he's one of the famous forest monks, and his story, what really impressed me with him, was that you know, he was, we call it like going wandering, walking from place to place. And he came to a village somewhere in, I think, the south of Thailand. And you always report to the head man of the village, first of all, so they know that you're there. And then they will sort of uh, prepare some food for you the following morning when you go on arms round. And the, Quite a few people there were really, you know, devout Buddhists in Thailand, and so they said, I oh, will come this evening to listen to a talk from you. And so he said, yeah, yeah, sure. And so that, you know, sometimes people think we get food for nothing, but, you know, we have to give a good talk first of all, otherwise we won't get nothing. <laughs> but anyway, sort of, you know, he said, okay, you know, come in a couple of hours, so they've got nothing to do for a couple of hours, and what does a monk do when they've got nothing to do? They sit meditation. So he found a nice tree and sat down and started meditating. And then he realized he hadn't been really mindful enough to, to, to really see where he was meditating. Because there's a big ant mound right next to him. 
and after just a minute or two, he could feel the red ants start, cr start crawling up his legs. And as they crawled up, ow, ow, they started biting him. And they're very painful. But he said, I'm a monk. I can endure this. <laughs> but after about 20 or 30 bites, then, and there's just thousands of them, then, he's amazing, he said that he just, he didn't know just jumping up and running, but he was running. He lost his mindfulness and he was running away. And at that point he said, no, I am a monk, I'm a forest monk. So he turned around and went straight back to where he'd been sitting and sat down in the middle of these thousands of ants again. Could you do that? So what happened next? The reason I tell the story, he changed his meditation object to loving kindness. May all ants be happy and well. Look, you know, I've, I've got plenty of blood there or flesh. You can take some if you want, but please leave me some. <laughs> or something like that, but just real kindness. You know, you've had that sort of feelings of kindness and love towards people, and sometimes they're so strong, even if someone is hurting you, just give kindness and joy and goodwill towards them. That's what he did. And then the next thing, he told us in his biography, the next thing he felt that the, the ants stopped biting him. The next thing, you could actually feel them just walking down his body rather than up his body. It's an amazing thing to see when you give kindness like that. And the last ant just left him. And they went into a very blissful meditation for the you know, hour or so, hour and a half he had. And when he came out of the meditation, you know, that's when what disturbed him was the sound of the, the villagers coming. You know, they had their dinner and they were coming to listen to a Dhamma talk from him. And what he didn't really understand in that part of Thailand, when they come into the presence of like a monk or a nun to listen to a talk, that they dance. And he thought, this is really weird, I hadn't seen this before. People dancing when they come into the presence of a monk. And he opened his eyes more fully and he realized <laughs> they weren't dancing as a cultural welcome. They were dancing because they'd been bitten alive by these millions of ants. And what he said, and it's, I totally accept this, this is what happened. Around him, there was a circle about maybe a meter in di diameter. There was no ants at all. And then there was millions of ants all around him, like protecting him. They wouldn't hurt him, but anyone who's disturbing his meditation, they would hurt. And it's amazing just to see how animals they can respond to kindness and feeling you're not harming them, you're safe. And just how they respond. So how can mothers-in-law respond? Fathers-in-law, bosses at work, of course they respond. If you do it with sincerity and with a little bit of power to give kindness to other beings, they just can't harm you. It's weird, but that is absolutely true. There's so many snake stories in Thailand. And of course, that famous snake story of, of one of the monks who came to stay here many years ago, that was Ajahn Ganha. I love telling this story because it's totally true, again, but weird. He was, you know, he was a, a teacher, a really good teacher in Thailand. He's still alive. It's very worth, worthwhile visiting if ever you go to Thailand when COVID stops and go to visit him. But he, was, uh, he was in the jungle with about six or seven other monks. And then they heard the big um, King Cobra come to them. And King Cobras. This is also true. In the northeast of Thailand, they had a special nickname for the King Cobra. And his nickname was called the One Step Snake. When I asked, why do you call it the One Step Snake? He said, because if it bites you, that's all you've got left to live. 
<laughs> one step and you fall down dead. Very venomous. And big too. And apparently, according to this story, because once this King Cobra came close, all the monks opened their eyes and you know, thought maybe of running away. But those of you who lived in Asia, if you've seen big snakes, you know they can run much faster than you can. That really scared me the first time I saw a snake run, or no, go very fast. No way could I, could I outrun it. But anyway, so that snake came right up to this monk, Ajahn Gangha. It was a cobra, a king cobra. So a big black snake. And it came right up and lifted its head and eyeballed Ajahn Gangha. You know, it spread its hood right in front of his nose. What would you do? It's a waste of time running. I said those cobras can go run much faster than you. And you can't sort of, you're a monk, you can't sort of harm it or hurt it. So what choice do you have? So I turned gun high, he just lifted up his hand and patted it on the head. There, thank you for coming to visit me. Now, you know how rare that must be for a cobra to have its head patted? <laughs> and that cobra loved every minute of it. It's such a rare opportunity, it was perfectly still, so he didn't sort of make the monk afraid, so he could have his head patted even longer. <laughs> that is a true story. But eventually the cobra sort of had enough of having his, pat, his head patted, so it closed its hood, went down, and went to see the next monk. You know the story, the next one I said, no, 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 no way, not me. If you want your head patty, go back to the chief monk again. Now how can that happen? And of course that happens because you're so kind that no one can harm you. And that same monk, I said he came to stay at Bodhinyana Monastery, when it was just being built about 36 years ago, 35 years ago. And what happened with him? You know, that we were, we had our plans in the council for our main hall. You know, the double hall, which you know, many of you have been in. And so it was all in the council. And then the, the mayor, the head of the council, I don't mind saying his name because, you know, he was a really good friend in the end. Clem Kentish, his name was. And he came to check us out. Who are these Buddhist monks? He was also our neighbour down the hill at the time, and he was the mayor. And he, basically, he ran the council to check us out. And he came, if you think I'm fat, he was probably fatter than me, <laughs> wearing a suit, you know, as mayors have to wear suits. And I really felt, felt for the suit because the, the buttons were almost coming off. It was just, I only just managed to button it up, and it was just stretching, and the button could pop at any time. But then what happened next really shocked me. This Thai monk, Ajahn Ganha, saw him first. And I was a bit too far away to stop Ajahn Ganha. And Ajahn Ganha went right up to him and started patting him on the tummy. <laughs> That's okay to pat me on the tummy, maybe, but to pat the mare. <laughs> This Australian guy <laughs> who was, came to check us out to make sure that we were legitimate people. And I thought, oh no, that's the end of our buildings. He will never give us approval anymore. But you know, what I saw next was just so wonderful. And again, I'm saying it accurately. This man, this really important person, is, is, he got a smile on his face and he was gurgling like a baby. He loved every minute of it. And Ajahn Gunha could do that to a mayor. He could do that, I don't know, to, to Donald Trump, Clive Palmer, he'd do anyone like that. <laughs> you know, especially Clive Palmer, he's a bit tummy, fat. And if, he, if Ajahn Gunha... <laughs> he had just so much kindness, people love that. And it's so much so that, you know, no problem with our building licenses after that. 
But what was for me, he became a really good friend in the end. Unfortunately, when he died, I went to his funeral service. I, I, I love these little extra stories. His daughter, Coralie, you know, she knew how much you know, he loved our monks and the good friendship we had. So you know what happens in Australia after a funeral? Sort of, you know, she came, I came up to her, give my best wishes, and she said, uh, uh, can I give you a hug? You're not supposed to hug monks, if you're girls. And I said, no, you can't do that. She said, yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> now, don't any of you try that, because she would wrestle sheep. <laughs> she was a farm, farm girl. I didn't have a chance. <laughs> I mean, it's... <laughs> no one remember her for that. So anyway, that, uh, that was a power of kindness. Now, imagine you can do that to, to mares and snakes. Members of your family will give you a hard time. It should be very easy to actually to change into really beautiful people because your kindness is just too strong. So that's one of the reasons why that this part of uh, our meditation practice, Buddhism, you know, to give this loving kindness to all beings. And then, you know, sometimes we do the chanting here, sometimes we do it in retreats. It's not to be underestimated how powerful that can be. You know, over in Serpentine, there's heaps of snakes. There was heaps of snakes over in Monastery in Thailand that never would bite anybody. How can you bite a friend and cause them injury? How can you just harm anybody, you know, who's kind to you? We really got into that. It was such a wonderful way of living. Even small things. One of the huts, which I built it myself, and I lived in there for a couple of years, that's, you know, the, the, the A-frame hut. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there was this big ant hill in front. And we said, well, it's a lovely place for a hut, but we can't harm the ants. So don't worry, I'll just build this myself and make sure we never, ever harmed that ant hill. That made sure that got lumps of wood concrete or whether, make sure we, we just always put it somewhere else. So we never harm the anthill or its tracks. And it was extra hard work for me to build it that way, but we finished it and I lived in there. And those ants, when I came out of my hut, I always make sure I would always step over their, their lines, never on top of them. They were very smart, so smart that I remember one day we got this sugar cube we put it on top of the ant mound to see what they would do with it. Because, you know, the sugar is like, you know, okay, fast food for the ants. They didn't have dentists, but who cares? Anyway, it was an experiment. Because what would they do with that? And I really thought they would just, you know, take lumps off it and then carry it uh, underneath to the, the heart of the ant mound underneath. They're much smarter than that. I never realized how great engineers these ants were, and they'd never been to any university. Every day I noticed the ant, um, not the ant, the sugar cube went a little bit lower every day. They were excavating from underneath it. And they excavated it, and when it got to the level of the top of the mound, then they got the earth and put it on top. No, they excavated it down day by day by day until it was down to where their food store was. I thought, that's a brilliant sort of engineering solution to a problem they'd never had before. No one else had given ants in the Darling Range a sugar cube, I'm sure. And it started me thinking about what intelligence is and, and respect for such beings. And so I never, I had no trouble at all with them. They would never bite me, they would never come into my hut. You know what happened next when I moved out to go to another hut? I just, and sometimes this like hurts me to rem remember this. One of the, the Anagarikas there, they drove over the ants mount with a vehicle. And you could see, see the damage there. And I, I went there to say sorry, but that was it. The ants never trusted us anymore. And so they'd come into that hut. And that's absolutely true, that if you're kind to the animals, 
around you. The animals will always look after you. Weird, but it's true. I remember this old monk told me this story. Beautiful story. He was, he was living alone in a forest. Loads of animals around. And one day, it was a big storm in the middle of the night, I think, that he heard a knocking on the door of his hut. He said, no one lives here. You know, someone was knocking. He opened the door. And there was a little monkey outside. A female monkey carrying a dead baby. This little monkey had a little dead offspring in its arms. The little monkey just gave it to the monk. He didn't need to understand monkey language, but it's obviously that that mother had just given birth you know, to that young, and it was dead. And so the, the monk didn't know what to do because you know, it can't bring it to life again, but just did some chanting for the little mother monkey, who was just so upset that you know, lost the young. And then afterwards, apparently what he did, then he gave the little baby monkey back to the mother and the mother took it away. And you can imagine, yeah, even a monkey, different species than human beings, but still you think, maybe these human beings may be able to do something, but couldn't. We did a little bit of chanting and that was it. There's a beautiful little stories like living in, <laughs> living in nature and just how animals, obviously my animal stories, I don't make these, these, these stories up, but I really respect the animals. Even these animals over in Thailand, in the north of Thailand, close to the Burmese border, in the jungles. I never expected to see this happen. And this was, uh, I put just a simple bowl of water out, you know, in the hot season, so the, the birds could have something to drink. You don't know what it's like when you're really thirsty. That right next to my hut, put the water out there, filled it every day. And it was like a knot hole in the wooden planks of the, of the, the wall. And I could see the birds come in the afternoon to get some water. But what I never, it was fun watching the birds bathe and drink. But what I never expected is, please excuse me, especially in Thailand, was to see all these birds of different sizes and species line up in a queue. Have you ever seen birds queuing? <laughs> I have, and it was true. <laughs> That's what they did. There were maybe eight or nine birds, maybe a dozen at the best, you know, and there were big ones, small ones, and they were sitting there just waiting until the one in front finished, and then the next one would actually come in. <laughs> and of course, it was fascinating. And then there was always, every afternoon, one bird would come in and would actually jump the queue and try and get in there first. Couldn't wait to have a bath or go have a drink. Weird. But you know what the other birds would do? They would all get out of queue, jump on that queue jumper, pick him and beat him and whatever, and that queue jumper would fly away. And then all those birds would queue up in exactly the order they were before. <laughs> it's unbelievable, absolutely true. And so what that really did was you know, increase your respect for you know, the animals in this world. And they don't just think they don't understand what you're saying. They don't understand much more what you're saying than you believe. So anyway, that is another reason why you can be kind to them and they'll look after you. And as human beings as well, sometimes human beings are not as sensitive. So they take a little bit more kindness to melt them and feel so safe with them. And so often in life, even the times when I used to go to those jails, and it's a long time since I've been in prison, I think I've done my time. <laughs> <laughs> but every time I went into prison to teach the prisoners, I always kept a record of how many hours I spent inside to use as credit in case. <laughs> nah. But you know, some of these prisoners were just, well, they were just really tough people. And I haven't told this story for a long time, but this was, you know, my first book, the story, and it was also the title of the German edition of my book. 
And the, any German speaking people here? Oh yeah, that was the coup de vine tea. The cow that cried, I probably pronounce it totally weird. The cow that cried. And that, for 20 years that's been a bestseller in Germany, the Spiegel bestseller list. But anyway, the, this was one of the, I went into the prison to teach meditation and this huge guy, he just grabbed me by the shoulder and pulled me aside. And this guy, he was, I could tell straight away because I was you know, brought up in the UK, he was from Northern Ireland. You know, and that place was a very violent city. They used to call it the Troubles. The Catholics and the Protestants were just oof, killing each other. And, but anyway, that you could see he was covered in scars, really big. And he said he had to tell me what happened to him the week before. He was waiting for me. And he gave background. He said he was born in Belfast, brought up in Belfast. And he said and he was first stabbed when he was about six years of age in school. It was primary school. And you know what six-year-old kids are like? Tiny kids. They just go into school for the first time. And then this bully in the school asked for his dinner money. And the money he had for his lunch. He said no. And the school bully never asked twice. Just got out a kitchen knife and just stabbed him in the arm. Teach him a lesson, don't say no to bullies. And what he did, this kid, you know, obviously blood running down his arm apparently, and just, he was, he said he never felt pain so much as just um, so much confusion. Why would people do this in the school? And he ran to his house, which was just around the corner, fortunately, and his father was home, unemployed. Daddy, I've been stabbed! And his father you know, took him to the kitchen. He never even washed the wound, let alone dressed the wound. He just opened the kitchen drawer, took out another knife and said, here you are, go and stab the boy back. And that spoke volumes of you know, how that kid was brought up. And he said, you know, he, he told me, he confessed he murdered many people, killed human beings. And you could see just how big he was and scarred he was. But I wasn't scared because you could see that something had changed in him. And he said that in that prison, next to, this was many years ago, Karna Prison Farm, they would have a slaughterhouse there. They'd raise, there's a farm, they'd raise cows and sheep, I don't know what else there. And they would, uh, kill those animals and they would send them to the different prisons for the food supply. And also, I can't understand why on earth they do this. Why that this was teaching those prisons a trade. So when they get out of prison they can get a job in the slaughterhouse. It makes no sense to me. But apparently, and this was true, the ones who would be the head slaughterer you had to fight for that job. It was the most prized job, you know, for macho men to do that job. And he won and was the head slaughterer in Karnat Pison Farm. And he just described what would happen there. This is his it's amazing how just well I remember this. The he really transfixed me. There's these big metal bars you know, wide at the entrance, but narrowing down. So at the far end, only one cow could come in at a time. And he would be standing on an elevated platform next to that cow. And it was, he said he had this electric stun gun. And he said the cow would always be trying to escape. So the first shot would be to stun to keep it still enough so he could aim properly. He obviously was trained the right place to, you know, just above the ear or somewhere, I'm not sure, where he can actually aim the second shot, and the second shot would always kill. And the next one would come in. He'd be doing this for months. And then, this day, they were told they needed cows. So, 
All the cows came in as usual, one shot to stun, one shot to kill. I always remember him saying that. But then, one cow came in, different from all the rest. All the other cows would make a sound, I don't know what that sound is, not a moo, it's just sounds of stress. You know, they're about to be executed, they knew exactly what was going on. They couldn't escape. But this cow came in, head down, and just walked, like purposely, to its place between those two strong steel bars. And only when it was positioned, it lifted up his head and stared at this executioner, silently, without moving, without trying to escape. And he, <laughs> I can't repeat what he said, because he started swearing now. He said to me, it's God's own something truth. That cow stared at me. And I just couldn't pull the trigger. I'd never seen anything like this. He was stunned. But what he noticed next just really threw him into, oh, what the heck is going on? Not the heck is going on, something else. Another expletive. And he saw in the, you know the cows have these huge eyeballs. You ever seen the eyeball of a cow? It's mammoth. But above the lower lid of the right eyeball, water started to accumulate. And it got more and more and more and more. And so that water started trickling over the, the cow's eye. You can imagine the confusion you see when this happens. And the, the cow was eyeballing and really still, not showing any fear but something else, the sadness. And then he noticed the same thing happening in the left eyeball. Above the lower eyelid, more water accumulating. Until that got so, so much that that also ran over the right, left eyeball of the cow. And he saw these two streams of water coming down the the cow's face. And that broke him. Violent people could never break that, uh, I don't know if he's Protestant or Catholic, but that very, very violent man. That couldn't crack him. The cow did. He threw down his gun. Swore like anything, apparently. I checked this out with the other prisoners afterwards. And yeah, that happened, that was true. He said, you can do whatever they like to him, but that cow's not dying. And he gave out that job. When he came to see me, then he started, <laughs> he started grinning, he said, I'm a vegetarian now. <laughs> and he was a murderer before. Incredibly violent man. And that's why, these are true stories. That's why you can imagine why that, that was the main story in Dekuta Vainti, which means the cow that cried. In the, um, the German edition of the book, sometimes, how do you overcome your slaughterer who's about to stun you once, second time to kill? How can you do that? Only with this beautiful, beautiful kindness, not fear, looking at the person who's about to put the bullet in your head, smiling really doing it properly, with kindness. And so, you can see that whoever you have in your life is causing you so much misery and fear or whatever it is they're causing you. Can you try some kindness? Sometimes it takes a long time. The last little story, again, it's, <laughs> it's from the same prison, because I, after that happened, you know, I often used to mention it to the prisoners there. And you know, just one of the nice things about teaching in a prison, that you may think this is weird to say, but many of those prisoners were honest. They said, look, you know, we're in prison now, there's no point in lying. And they said to me, said, I don't believe that loving kindness works. Maybe with some people, 
but not with old people. There are some people who just you can't get through to them. You might call them like psychopaths or whatever, but this is one of those stories where I sometimes doubt that, that you're not really going long enough or uh, persisting, because this was the case of the prison officer. And one of the prisoners there is really nice. <laughs> How can I say this? Really nice fellow. He's a prisoner, for goodness sake. But he became a good friend afterwards. But he said, I asked him, he said, OK, I want to have a bet with you. No stakes at all, but challenge you. He said, in this prison, who is the person you hate the most? And he didn't, he didn't need to sort of uh, even hesitate. He was one of the prison officers. He was a senior prison officer on the staff. And he said, what well, he actually, he called him a pig. And that was actually being quite <laughs> moderate. And he said, what do you mean? What sort of stuff does he do? He said, well, this happened last week. And one of the prisoners, you know, it's kind of prison farm. It's hard to get to unless you've got a car. There's no, no bus service there. And he said one of the prisoner's wives managed to get a lift to see her husband. He hadn't had a visit for weeks. And so you can't just walk in. You've just got to go and register first of all. And so she registered at the entryway during the visiting hours. And this prison officer saw her and knew exactly who she was. And so he immediately got on the PA system and said to this prisoner, he said, can you please do a job for me on the other side of the prison, at a place where the PA system wouldn't reach? He did it on purpose. Because a few minutes later, could prisoner so-and-so come to the visitor center, your wife has come? He couldn't hear that. It was done on purpose. And this prison officer had never told you know, where that prisoner was. And when the other prison officers finally found him, located him, oh, I'm sorry, the visiting hours are over, better luck next time. And it's, why do people do such cruel things? You know, a visit from you know, your loved one, so hard to do, and he had one there, he wasn't misbehaving, it was a prison officer who was misbehaving, sent him to a place in the prison so he couldn't get his visit. So he said, this guy's a pig. Oh no, so it wasn't a pig, he said a dog. I don't know prison slang, but anyway, that was low. So anyway, I said, right, we, we have a contest. What I want you to, because this guy also, he would serve tea and coffee to this fellow every day, that was his job, and clean up afterwards. So every time you make a cup of coffee for him, a cup of tea, or get a biscuit or a sandwich, whatever he wants, always say to this guy, Please enjoy that sandwich, sir. I hope this tea is nice for you. Say that every time. And it's only because this prisoner actually respected me, he actually did this. Other people thought he was stupid. And every week I would go there. How's it going? Hopeless. It's not working, Ajahn Brahm. Look, I know these prison officers. There's no way this guy is going to sort of you know, do anything. I just serve him the tea, and I really put effort into it, try and make it really nice. I give it to him, and he doesn't even know I exist. He just carries on working, or whatever he's doing. He totally ignores me. And I remember this story, because it made me so happy that after about three or four months, when I went in there, how's it going? And he couldn't wait to tell me. Something had shifted. He managed to find some special tea or coffee or whatever and handed it to this prison officer and said, oh, I found this really nice coffee. I hope you like it, sir. And the prison officer went, uh. <laughs> the prison officer grunted, acknowledged this man existed. And <laughs> that really encouraged him. You may think that's nothing, but in prisoner, for a prison officer like that, to actually acknowledge the existence of another prisoner by just going, uh, that was huge. And I, I said, I know how these things work. It was only a matter of, you know, a week or two. Then of course the crack was in the wall and the dam totally burst 
a couple of weeks later when he got him a special sandwich. I said, I hear you really like these sandwiches. I hope you like this one. I made it specially for you, sir. And the prison officer turned around and said, thank you. And I was told by these prisoners that that went all around the prison grapevine in Western Australia. And I don't need to doubt them. You know, there's a grapevine there. You know, what goes on in one prison? They managed to find a way of letting everyone else know. That, that prison officer could say thank you to a prisoner was unheard of. I won, or rather like loving kindness went. How does, it took about four months. So whoever told me that story about, you know, your uh, f close family member, just give a cup of, or him a cup of tea, or then say, I hope you like this, or I hope you like this, hope you like this, may this be nice, and maybe, who knows, after a while they may grunt. <laughs> Once they grunt, that's it. <laughs> they acknowledge you. And they know just the rest is pretty easy. It's nice to receive kindness. It's lovely to be kind. Why can't we give that a try? You've got to be careful sometimes because, as I said to this person, first of all, you've got to be kind at a distance. That's an old Chinese saying love the tiger but at a distance. <laughs> Otherwise you get your hand cut off. But little by little the tiger becomes your friend. Have you seen that old movie? It's not a movie, it's a movie clip on YouTube of this fellow, he tra trained, a, was it a lion or a tiger? I think it was a lion. And then just you know, freed it so the lion could actually live in nature where you know it felt happy. And then <laughs> just the lion just went off into the jungle no, go back to nature. He came to visit a year or two later and the lion heard it and just went running towards him and just jumped on him, not to eat him, just to meet an old friend. <laughs> so that's what the kindness is. It just goes way beyond um, species or gender. It's something which is beautiful. It seems like everybody recognizes that. So that's one of the reasons why, if you're having a hard time with somebody at work, could be a boss, be kind to them. That was the last little story, I don't know if they're here this evening, they told me this three or four years ago. They were just in the same level in this big company. One of them got promoted, became the other one's boss. And as soon as she became boss, her whole character changed. And they're ordering around, do this, do that, do this, whatever. And this lady used to come here, I'm not sure if she's here this evening. She said, that made my life hell, you know, in the office. You know, what was once my friend was actually giving me orders all the time and getting really upset and angry at me. And then she said, what changed everything? Because she knew the type of coffee she liked. They'd always go out for coffee together at their break time. So she went out and got a special cup of coffee, the thing which her boss liked and just gave it to her. You know, you need to like this coffee, drink it with me, this is for you. A simple thing like that changed the whole relationship. Yeah, the, the other lady was still her boss, but now they were friends. Tiny acts of kindness have huge effects. Thank you, Mr. Gong. <laughs> okay, I've got to be careful because I keep on talking too much, but I think that's really just a beautiful way of, of acting in life. Have some kindness. Okay, so, okay. We get this one, another story? I haven't said this story for a long Okay, one last story, I'll take this. Can you get this for me? And then we'll get this. This, <laughs> this is that story of the burglar. In a temple, not this temple, another temple somewhere. The middle of the night, have you had any burglars come to your place? Middle of the night, the senior monk, the abbot, was woken up about one or two o'clock in the morning, thinking that maybe one of the monks had got up early to meditate. But then he thought again, said, no, not my monks, they don't get up there. <laughs> so he got out of bed and went to the shrine room and he saw there was a burglar there. 
the burglar <laughs> had a knife and was trying to open up the donation box. And the burglar saw the monk and said, don't do anything, I'll kill you. And the monk just put, the old monk, not that old, but put his hand in his pocket. Don't do anything funny, I'm serious. And the monk brought out a bunch of keys. He said, these are the keys to the donation box. Here, and he threw them over gently. Help yourself. Is this a trick? <laughs> no, look, we're Buddhists. We're supposed to be kind. You obviously need this money more than the temple does. I shouldn't say that. If the, the treasure's not here, is it? No. <laughs> Please take it. And so the, the thief, you know, he had one eye, that's why we have two eyes, one eye opening the box, the other eye on the monk, in case he did any funny business. And then the monk said, when was the last time you ate? None of your business! Be quiet! <laughs> Am I convincing being a burglar? <laughs> no, okay. I'll try. <laughs> so, <laughs> they said, in the cupboard just above, there's some food left over from our lunch yesterday. Take as much as you want. And so the burglar is stuffing cash in his pockets and saw there was food above. So he stuffed food in there next, as much as he could carry. And don't call the police! Why should I call the police? said the, the monk. I've given this to you. Please enjoy it for free. And then the, the burglar ran away. And the following morning, now if that was, suppose that was me and I told you, would you sack me as, you know, the senior monk? Because he's our president, don't answer. <laughs> they said, well, that's a wonderful thing to do. You know, you're being kind. Isn't that wonderful that people are actually kind in the world? So anyway, money will come again later on. We can, we can put that in the budget, you know, for burglars. <laughs> but anyway. Anyway, just the next day he saw in the newspaper the burglar was caught. You know, he was robbing another house and people weren't so kind there. He was given ten years in jail. Another ten years went past. The monk was much older now. And you know, maybe because he didn't sleep so much. But in the middle of the night he heard a noise again. He went to check out what was happening. And who did you think he saw with a knife next to the donation box? The burglar, the same guy, ten years older. And the monk said, oh, here are the keys. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when the burglar put down his knife and smiled at the monk. He said, monk, I've come here to steal again. You can take what you want, it's okay. But I, last time I realized I stole the wrong thing. For ten years I've been in jail. Ten years I've been thinking about you. Can't get you out of my head. You're the only person who was kind to me. Who never wanted to hurt me. I was stealing from your donation box, pointing a knife at you. And you just thought I was hungry, which I was. You gave me food as well as that money. I've come here to steal again, but not money or food. Please teach me the secret of kindness and generosity. That's what I want to steal from you. How to be kind, how to be generous. I thought it was a beautiful story. Isn't that what you would like to steal? Of course, we've got so much of that here. You can have as much as you like. <laughs> and, th and that will not affect our budget. <laughs>
<laughs> it's what we're here for. Okay, thank you for listening. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh my goodness, that gets me that story. And it's, it's not a true story, but it was adapted from the stories which have happened in places like Sri Lanka and Thailand, where monks have just given them money away. Was this monk, I think in, a long time ago in Thailand, I heard this, that someone came to steal boats, because that's how monks would travel from place to place in those days in Thailand with boats. And the guy sort of had a stick or a knife or something, a machete, and the monk just got the keys out to take it. And then the next day they found out that one of the boats was missing, said, oh yeah, I gave it away to the burglar last night. And people were so impressed, the next day they got four or five boats given to them, donations. Really good stories, of course, you know, people would help out. Anyway, uh, I have a question for Ajahn Brah. My dad passed away two years ago, I don't know where his niche. I've been dreaming and thinking about him, any advice? Well, usually, you know, because we Buddhists believe in rebirth, if your loved one has passed away, and you have successive dreams, exactly the same, such as you know, your dream is in this place or that place, then it's liable to be maybe some truth behind it. But if it's different dreams, different sort of clothes he's wearing, different occasions, it's probably just, you know, just dreams, that's all. I would say if it's like three dreams in a row, it looks exactly the same, then maybe there's something to it. <coughs> From Indonesia, I heard hypnotherapists saying that under hyp hypnosis, some of the clients went to a stage where there's this beautiful light inside their minds. Could it be the same as the nimitta? And what's the difference between deep peaceful states coming from meditation and from hypnosis? Could both lead to the same insights and same impact of removal from mental blockages? It could be the same thing, but because under hypnosis it's actually almost put inside of you, it's not natural in the sense it comes just from within your own stillness, it's never as powerful. So the difference is that if that comes in like a beautiful uh, light which appears in your meditation because you know, it's just natural, you've been letting go a lot, it's not um, imposed upon you by the, the therapist, that's way, way more powerful. From USA, uh, I want to be a good dad and take my kid to the pool, but seeing the women in bathing suits leads to many lustful thoughts affects my meditation, I feel really guilty advice. I already gave the answer to that, because when I went to that Bunbury Beach, and saw the incredibly beautiful young lady, 17 in, in, bath in bikinis, one on either side of me, did that affect my meditation? Of course not. It was just, you know, I was only scared, you know, trying to explain it to others. So I had nothing to do with this, oh yes. <laughs> So because of that, uh, for your, take your kid to the pool. You, you can't sort of, uh, okay, put your kid to the pool and put sort of uh, <laughs> eye, eye shades on him, so does he, I don't know. No, sometimes you have to expose people to just, you know, the desires and lusts in this world. They don't have to taste them, but they have to see what it does. You can't hide things from people, otherwise if you try and hide things from people, your kid finds out about it anyway. What is it, those books which are banned become the most popular? Anyone said, don't watch this, this is really just it evokes too much lust in you. Everyone wants to see that. You just take it as normal, they just take the kid to the beach, or to the pool, and say that's all it is, it's just human beings. So, Please take your kid to the pool. Is that what they mean? It's from the United States, not the pool club. Where they play pool. I don't know. Anyway. From UK, thank you for your wonderful wisdom and calming talks. I struggle with anxiety and fear of my mental health getting worse and causing me to lose what I love. How can I heal this? Please, the biggest problem there is worry and anxiety. Worry it will get worse. Why don't you worry? It might actually get better. Don't always think it's going to get worse, it's going to get worse, it's going to get worse, and then it does get worse. Think it's going to get better, it's going to get better, it's going to get better. But you know, you do lose a lot of privileges if it gets better. You have to go to work, you can't take so much time off when things get better. 
That's like with people with depression sometimes. I told us this guy years ago. I said, look, when the depression starts to go, don't tell your wife. <laughs> don't tell your boss at work. Okay, once you tell your wife and boss at work, you'll have to come and help with the housework, go back and doing all these jobs at work. You've got very many privileges being depressed. And I remember this because he told me afterwards, yes, yeah, so true. You know, this morning I had two bowls of ice cream. My wife would never let me have two bowls of ice cream when I was okay, but now she thinks I'm depressed. Oh, you have a third bowl. <laughs> There's many, many advantages <laughs> to have that. The main reason I was saying that, don't be so depressed about being depressed. There's many advantages to it. So, uh, but with mental health, don't ever think it's going to get worse. Because then you make it worse. Just, oh, just, you know, they come and go. What goes up goes down. So you should be fine. Okay, my goodness. From Malaysia, I'm having this cancer journey since 2018. And doctor told me that I have to go through chemo every three months. Oh, my goodness. Should I continue my chemotherapy treatment or should I stop? Because the journey is tiring. I felt like my body were tore apart every time I went through. I, I don't know, I read this article years ago that sometimes doing exercise is almost as good as doing chemotherapy. I'm not an expert on this, but I know how much your mental attitude affects, you know, the, um, the cancer. So I don't know exactly how far you've gone with that cancer. Since 2018, just you know what stage, it, stage it's in. But if you have to go through chemo every three months, and that's a three months is a long time, so at least between the chemo you last done and the next chemo, which is due, how about doing some really good exercise, nice meditation, change attitudes, do good stuff, and then see what happens when they, they usually give you a test before they give you the next chemotherapy. See if they look at that test. And one of the nicest things that's happened to a few of my people I've taught, they do a, a, a test, a scan, and they say, oh, oh, we have to do the scan again. Something wrong with the machine. <laughs> Nothing wrong with the machine. Uh, cancer's gone. And that's happened many times. People have told me this. So, in the meantime, between those bouts of chemo, just see if you can do something else. And those doctors maybe see that tumor or whatever it is get less and less and less. Lastly, California. My 26-year-old son told us a year ago he's going through a rough patch and needed some space and then cut off contact with all friends. We are really worried what to do. That You cannot force him to contact you. It's a year ago. Just you know, let him know that, you know that the door of my heart is always open to you. you know, you're his father. Whatever happens to you in your life, you know, just I'm always your dad. And you can always come home, I'd always look after you. You've got your mum here as well. And that's all you can really do. Open the door of your heart. Because sometimes it's your son's fault. And I say this because I remember the saying of, uh, what was his name before he was Mark Twain? Uh, you know, the, the, um, the author, Mark Twain. What was his name, a real name? Okay, anyway. <laughs> that was his pen name. But anyway, the, he ran away from home when he was about 18. He ran away to have some adventures. His father was, you know, he didn't like his father, too controlling or whatever it was, always having arguments. And he ran away for a couple of years, and when he went back to visit his dad, he wrote, you know, in the typical Mark Twain way, a bit of satire, he said, I can't believe how much my father has grown over the last two years and how much he has learnt. <laughs> Obviously the meaning was his father was the same, but Mark Twain, you know, just going out into the big world, had learnt so much, it was nowhere near as critical to his father once he had more experience of the world. So that sometimes we have to let our kids go. They go out in the big world, when they come back, sometimes they come back to such amazing kids They've learned so much. You know, the first time I left home, 
And when my father had already died, my mother's consent, I don't know why she let me do this, I was only 17 years of age. I had a guitar and a backpack, and I went hitchhiking from London all the way to um, North Africa, Morocco, Algeria. It's really dangerous. I wasn't into drugs or anything, I just wanted to, some freedom and experiment and see what see the world. And she let me do that. I really gave my mother a hard time. Shouldn't have done that. But of course, the hardest thing I did for my mother, if you want to leave, you can leave, but did I tell that story about the birthday gift I gave her? Was that last week? Was it? They're here. Okay. Because you know, sometimes people think, oh, Ajahn Brahm, you're probably born with a bald head. You must, you must have such a good, be a good kid when you were young. It was my, my mother's birthday. And there was, I needed to get a present for her. I was about seven or eight years of age, I think. Somewhere around that age, seven or eight. I was really smart, sneaky and get away with all sorts of silly things. And this time, there was a type of food available in London called uh, mashed potatoes and jellied eels. No, eels. I think I did tell this story, didn't I? Somewhere I told it. Tell it here? No, somebody was trying to say. Anyway, I was only no, what, seven or eight years of age. I went to the shop and bought an eel. A live one. <laughs> and I had a shoebox. Don't get any ideas, Shanti, over there for your mum. Little kid over there used to sleep good. <laughs> and I bought a live eel. I had a box already. Put the eel in the box. It's still alive. And had this beautiful birthday wrapping paper, you know, just with beautiful flowers and I love my mummy on it. And I, <laughs> I, I wrapped it up with as much care as I possibly could. And the nice little gift card on the outside. To mummy, happy birthday from your son. <laughs> and when I gave that to my mum, she almost melted. Ah, oh, so sweet, such a surprise. Did it all by yourself? Yes, mummy. Please enjoy. <laughs> and my mother never suspected a thing until she opened it. And she screamed so loud. She got a live eel, and the, I, one of the things I do remember, the eel actually raised its head when it came, it's only an eel, it's not dangerous, but it raised its head in front of my mum, almost like it was trained. Ah! And I ran away and hid for two hours. <laughs> that was me as a young man. Anyway, so sometimes you have to let your kid just experience things, but Going through a rough patch, needing some space, cut off contact with old friends. We are really worried what to do. I don't know, maybe you're thinking, my, if you can get someone to just kind of trace him without you knowing he's traced, make sure he's just still alive and okay. That's about as much as you can do. There's no friends, maybe get the private detective just to check out on him without, you know, that you, he knowing that it's you looking out for him. And so it shows you still care, but it's still giving him his freedom to work out his whatever he's going through himself. Okay, there we go. Talking too long again. So and we can now pay respects to Buddha Dhamma Sangha, and then those of you who wish to stay longer for some more questions, you're most welcome. Arahang Sama Sambodo Bagawa Bodang Bagawan Tang Abiwa Demi Soakato Bagawata Damo Damang Namasami Supati Pano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangang Namami
very good. Thank you for waiting. I'm sorry I keep on talking too much.